when I look at the political landscape and the economic landscape of the world, I really have a difficult time accepting that this is what life should be. I had so many concerns about education, technology, agriculture, biodiversity, health, the environment. You, you will be so surprised as to what they are engaged in. If we can do that, we can walk on that path, we will find a lot of solutions, we'll find a lot of adventures, we'll find a lot of answers. We need to foster that entrepreneurial spirit. No judgment, no negativity, all good vibes and conversations. All this and more right here on Grassroots Radio. Hello, faithful listeners. Welcome to another episode of Grassroots Radio. I'm your host, Unique Bird, and this week we are bringing you the final episode of Grassroots Radio Season 1. We will be gone for a little while, but not to worry, we will be back in January for Season 2 of the show. In the interim, we will also be publishing a number of bonus episodes, which will feature never-before-heard material from interviews that were recorded for Season 1, but for different reasons we were not able to publish in their entirety. We will also be featuring some content that previously hit our cutting room floor from some of the interviews you already know and love. So you can look forward to these bonus episodes throughout the month of November. Also happening throughout the month of November is the New Grassroots National Youth Survey. We talk a lot at the New Grassroots about the importance of designing solutions and not just having discussions. And so in an attempt to move towards solution building, we will be launching the survey to get a more accurate picture of the population that we're actually designing solutions for. So the survey will ask things like, yes, the general demographic information that people are used to seeing on surveys, but this is also going to go deeper into attitudes, beliefs, and also hopes and aspirations of the young people in our country. If that sounds like something that you would like to add your voice to, you can go to thenewgrassroots.com. Later today, the questionnaire will be live and you can go ahead and take it. And once you're done taking the survey, you can go ahead and share it with others so they can take it as well. The more responses we have, the more viable and valid and reliable our results are going to be, and therefore the better the solutions that we come up with are going to be because they will actually match the problem. My featured guest today is Zachary Phillip, who is a final year law student at the University of the West Indies Mona campus and looking forward to joining the world of work next year. Zachary is also one of the founding members of the New Grassroots, so it's actually quite a treat for me to have him here and to pick his brain about what he is looking forward to in his own future and what he sees for the future of Antigua and Barbuda and our wider region. And last but certainly not least before we get into our interview with Zachary, I want to give a big, big thank you to all of our listeners, our followers on social media, of course, the guests of this podcast, and to my co-producer, Grace Ann James, and my co-founder, Vanilla Francis, for everything that they have both been doing, sometimes in the background, that makes this podcast work, but not only this podcast, but the entire NGR community and family. Also, big thank you to everyone who has joined and been participating in our quite lively WhatsApp group. You guys really make doing all of this worthwhile. So thank you, thank you, thank you so much for your love and positivity. I'll catch you all again in season two. Hello, everyone. My name is Zachary Allen Roy Phillips. I'm 25 years of age. I'm born and raised in Antigua and Barbuda. 
And uh, I'm currently in my last year of legal training. I attend the Norman Manley Law School, which is located in Jamaica. And in 2020, I will officially be an attorney at law. And what prompted you or what inspired you to pursue the field of law in particular? Uh, that's an interesting question. To be honest, well, some background information. My grandfather was an attorney general and he was also a prominent lawyer in Antigua in his day. And none of his children entered the legal field. So when I was born, being the first grandchild, I was constantly told by my family and friends of my family that I'll be the one taking over the legal profession. And from since I'm young, I do not like being told what to do. <laughs> so I've always been opposed to the idea of being a lawyer. And even when I watched the TV shows about you know, law and order and those type of things, which really glamorizes the role, I was, I was apprehensive of being a criminal lawyer because I, I didn't really want to be involved so intricately with criminals. Um, but so in my teenage rebellion years, I told myself, I'm never, ever going to do law. I started at my university, University of the West Indies, Cafield Campus, with a political science degree, actually. And I finished that degree. And while I was there, I did take some law courses, but they weren't involved with the criminal side of law. It was more involved with the governmental and state building um, side of it. And I really, really felt a passion for it. And I decided, well, you know what, this, this is something that I'm good at. And I see a future in this field. So I guess I should have listened to my grandmother earlier. <laughs> <laughs> Well, sometimes the rebellious path um, teaches you lessons in and of itself. So I just wanted to ask you about your grandfather, who was an attorney general at one point. Can you say what his name was and then what period of time he served as the attorney general? Yes, his name is Cosmas Phillips. He was attorney general. Wow. I don't know the exact dates. <laughs> this is embarrassing. But I know he was its attorney general, the period immediately before we became independent. Oh, so wow. He was involved with drafting and the negotiations surrounding the independence of Antigua and Barbuda. That's amazing. While you were studying political science, you said you had a passion for state building. How has that passion now been translated into your law studies? Okay, um, thank you for that question. So a lot of people aren't aware that the legal field comprises many, 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 many different areas. So it's not only representing people who break the law per se, but you could also um, represent environmental issues. There's a whole category called environmental law. Uh, the UN groups and World Trade Organization, all of those have lawyers that are specific to those areas. So there's trade law, there's human rights law. I was very um, drawn to the area known as international law, which deals with countries relating to one another and the rules in which countries would negotiates or um, solve issues as a group as opposed to individual nations. So a good example of international law is the CARICOM and its, its bodies, the Caribbean community, CARICOM, and its subsidiary organizations. All of that is governed by a set of rules, a set of treaties that is created from the concept of international law. And that's the area that I'm very, very interested in. So when I say state building, how that ties back to state building, well, CARICOM is a sort of a super, or the ideal, I should say, is to create a connection between government states and therefore some sort of super mm, governmental authority or super authority. So the way that we govern ourselves in Antigua or the way that we govern ourselves at the even local level, um, Barbuda Council, etc., will be mimicked on a larger scale with organizations such as CARICOM and the OECS. And yeah, that's how it ties in together. <laughs> and okay, since you mentioned CARICOM, let's go down that road a little bit. 
you kind of describe what would be the ideal situation. In your current estimation, how far would you say or how wide is the gap between that ideal state of Karakum's existence and how it would function and where we are today? That, that's a very loaded question. <laughs> I'm not employed yet, so I don't know how much I can answer. But <laughs> from my personal point, opinion and perspective so far. Yes, from my perspective, I, I think that Karakum is really focused on one particular era, area, sorry, and that area is economic cooperation. So whereas um, drawing comparison, for example, to the EU, they are connected on a deeper level, including um, education, health, uh, immigration policy, and those sorts of things. It's much more intricate. I think CARICOM's main focus, I would say, from what I've studied, has been economics. Other things are involved as well, um, for example, education. Uh, but the main, main drive is economics. How well have we achieved that economic integration uh i would say there have been strides that have been made i would definitely say that the bigger caricom economies such as Trinidad and jamaica for example they have benefited in that the other islands import a lot more of their products so they're not only supplying their own local market but they're supplying the regional market as well but I don't think all that was intended, as, as you rightly said in the question, the ideal, I don't think the ideal has been achieved. And some major setbacks, for example, are immigration, the movement of people between the islands. We still have a problem with that. And I would also say not every island is benefiting equally. So there are some islands that are doing much better because of this system. And there are some islands who, who are facing a lot of the, the negative effects as well. Mm -hmm. And it's not just the big islands are benefiting because also bigger islands would have to contribute more to CARICOM than smaller islands do. And that is an expense that bigger countries in the region consistently complain about. Interesting. And you've lived now in, uh, well, three Caribbean islands that I know of. So Antigua, you went to school in Barbados, and you're now in school in Jamaica. Yes. Are you noticing, I don't know, any maybe cultural differences or some of the, the things that you just explained that, you know, you're seeing some of the benefits of CARICOM more in some places than in others. Have you had personal experiences with some of those differences across these different islands that you had the opportunity to live and potentially work in? Um, yes, definitely, definitely. I, off the top of my head, the first thing that comes to mind is I, when I went to Jamaica for schooling, was the first time, that was the first time that I realized so many products that are on the shelves in Antigua were actually made in the Caribbean. Mm -hmm. So um, Maggie, uh, Grace, all those products that say Grace on them, I've literally driven past the factory in Jamaica mm -hmm. that makes them. And that was when I realized, well, the markets are definitely, or this company, Grace, for example, is definitely benefiting from the integration because I have grown up on these, these are staples in my house. <laughs> They're staples in most of our houses. And it just never occurred to me that, that this was, I don't know where I thought it came from, but it's never a question I had to ask, but these are Jamaican products that are very much, um, in, 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 I don't know what word I'm looking for. They're very much in our everyday lives in Antigua. And I would say, make the assumption and say in the wider region as well. well uh, even here in Canada, I buy Grace products all the time. Yeah, see? <laughs> yeah, so they're all over. <laughs> yeah, definitely. That I've seen, that, that was a stark, stark, stark um, benefit that I, I noticed upon traveling. I should also say that immigration is something that every island I go to, it seems to have different rules or a different process. Mm -hmm. And I think 
especially having studied this area, I really do think that there needs to be some standardization as to how we treat people within the region because it, it almost feels like it's the luck of the draw, depending on if you have a good uh, um, immigration uh, situation or if you have a bad one. Um, and I, I, I have also traveled with people from other islands so not just based on my perspective as an Antigua national, I've also traveled with Jamaican nationals or Trinidadians or Catitians, et cetera. And three of us would be in a line with different passports and okay. three of us would get completely different treatment. And I do think that that's a major problem that should be fixed. Mm -hmm. And when you say travel, you mean just within the region you're experiencing? Yes, yes just within the region. Wow. Yeah, that really shouldn't be happening. <laughs> and what about your travels outside of the region? Thank you for asking. Um, I have, I ended up doing a master's degree in public international law in London at the Queen Mary University of London. And that was, that was an interesting experience. Um, I would say one of, in relation to Caribbean integration, since that's the wider topic that we're talking about right now, mm -hmm. I would say that I definitely feel the further away we are from home is the more homogenous or the more people, we stick together as one unit or one block. So in London, it's not really, yes, you can find Antiguan specifically, but more times you would find West Indians or okay. West Indian culture or a West Indian um, neighborhood. And every flag from the region is flown side by side proudly. There's no infighting. We're all just happy to be able to eat, you know, some food with spice in it, to be quite honest, because <laughs> <laughs> that's a struggle. <laughs> yes, the English are not known for their delectable cuisine. <laughs> Um, I think, and I, I, I do think that's really useful to be able to find a group. And I would say that CARICOM and the OECS as well has helped with creating that solidarity overseas. Because I generally feel overseas, if I walk down Oxford Street and someone hears my accent, they would ask, where are you from? I would say Antigua. And they'd say, oh, brother, I'm from Barbados. Or, yeah, that's, that's so close to home. I'm from St. Lucia. You know, they still feel connected because it's a region in, you know, their minds. Mm -hmm. And in my mind, too. <laughs> yeah. And I guess, too, because it's so, it's more rare that you will encounter someone like that up there. So when you do, it's like, oh, my God, here yeah. you are. Definitely, definitely. Whereas when you're at home, it's a bit more like, why are you here taking, creating competition for me? Unfortunately, that is the response that most of us do give. What, what response do you have in turn to people who see regional integration as more of a threat than it is an opportunity? Ooh, this is a very nice question. Yeah. I mm -hmm. personally believe that most people see integration as a threat because they see, they see it as a bunch of foreigners, non-nationals, others, people who are not us coming into your land and taking what is yours. And I think while I understand the, the fear that that could create, I think what's more important or what a lot of people are not actively considering is that if you view it as one region, then that means there may be 50 jobs in your field in Antigua, for example, but there may be 50 more jobs in Dominica or 70 jobs in St. Lucia or 100 jobs in Barbados. And I think a lot of people don't, they want the benefits that come with integration, but they consider moving and leaving their home to, to achieve those benefits as, as not a viable option. Nobody wants to leave. And because people are coming into their country, 
they feel like they need to protect what is theirs and keep it separate and isolated. And in my mind, I've always thought, uh, I use the analogy of the Hunger Games. I know it's kind of naive, quote unquote, but I've always thought of it this way. There were 12 districts in the Hunger Games and all of the districts gave a vital source of be it raw material or services to the capital. The capital benefited from it and never gave anything back to the districts. So in comparison, in the Caribbean, we should look at it as each island is supplying other islands with services and raw materials, yes. But we are not going to behave like the capital and keep it all hoarded in one place. No, we're going to exchange the raw materials and services between all the islands so that it's not a situation of districts and capital. It's a situation of all the districts being benefiting in the same way that the capital did. And if you haven't read the book, this is just a shameless plug. Go and read the books. They're wonderful. <laughs> nice advertisement for the Hunger Games. <laughs> uh, okay, I think that's a really interesting analogy. And from some of the conversations I've been having with other young people in and around Antigua, one of the, um, one of the places where that effect of like the hoarding of the resources seems to be occurring or where people perceive it to be occurring isn't so much between the islands, but between classes within the individual islands. So for instance, you will have in Antigua, let's say a political class or the upper middle class people who tend to have a lot more resources than everyone else. And things just don't seem to be very evenly distributed. So you have a set of people, a minority of people who see who see more of the opportunities and who have more access to opportunities. And then every, you have a lot of people at the bottom that because they're in a state of privation or near poverty and just trying to survive, they don't really have the latitude to be thinking about, you know, the broader issues and thinking to themselves, you know what, if things aren't working out for me here, I have the option of going elsewhere to pursue this because they just may not have the resources. So do you have a response or a perspective on that particular kind of outlook? Uh, thank you very much for that question. And uh, I do, I have noted, I should have said it in my last response, but I have definitely noted that most of the benefit that is felt within CARICOM is, is experienced by the upper classes in society. And I do think in the long term, that in of itself will be a downfall of CARICOM because if only the upper classes are the ones benefiting, then the lower classes seeing no benefit of the system, but surely seeing the disadvantages of the system, they, they will mobilize the governments to move away from it. And the lower classes outnumber the upper classes in every Caribbean society. Um, I personally think one of, the region, one of the reasons that perhaps this is, that perhaps the upper class is the only one experiencing the benefits that CARICOM has to offer is because of the prohibitive pricing of travel between the islands. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I mean, it's all well and good to read in a book that as you rightly said, it's all well and good to read in a book that there are, I don't know, 20 jobs in agriculture available in Dominica. But if you can't afford the flight to Dominica, then it doesn't benefit you in any way. Mm -hmm. And I've always, I do appreciate that there seems to be a social movement amongst younger people to try and strong arm our governments into allowing or facilitating travel between the islands. And it's, it's a peculiar situation. And I understand the arguments of the governments as well, because we are quote unquote independent nations and governments raise a lot of money from taxes traveling in and out of, the, of people, taxing people traveling in and out of the island. So in order for the travel to be subsidized, the governments would have to give an expense. 
but that expense is not a direct benefit, or at least to them, it's not a direct benefit to the local population. It's an expense that benefits other people coming in or leaving the country. So again, the mentality that it's my island which needs to benefit more than any other island mm -hmm. is not going to work if CARICOM is to survive. You have to think of it as all of our islands will benefit from certain decisions. And one of those decisions is subsidizing travel between the islands. Yeah, there is a lot to that. Um, in particular, I'm thinking about the mindset of, you know, it's a zero sum game that we're playing. So if anybody's going to have benefits, that means that someone has to lose. And it seems to me like the Caribbean people of the younger generation are rejecting that, you know, that story in a lot of ways, right? Because it is kind of just a story. There's no reason why if I'm going to have something good, it means that I have to take it away from somebody else. First of all, do you agree that younger people are starting to shift their mindset around that kind of thing? And what would you attribute that shift to if indeed there is a shift? I definitely think that young people have a completely different outlook on on Caribbean society than older people do. Um, one of the arguments I consistently have with my family is our different views on tradition. So my, m the older generations in my family, they usually are stout, they're staunch supporters of anything that's been happening since, I don't know, the last 10 years. If, if it's been going on consistently, for more than 10 years, it's right and we must keep it up. Um, yes. <laughs> to be honest, You're familiar with that mindset. <laughs> I think we all are. <laughs> it's, um, oh. <laughs> to be honest, it's just that one of the things that I've thought about and attribute this to is that tradition is very strong in English culture. And a lot of the generation above us, whether they were distant or not, they were born into the United Kingdom. They were colonies of the UK, citizens, mm -hmm. they have passports, all of that. Mm -hmm. So their rules, a lot of the rules that we follow now came directly from the UK. And it's not normal for people to question tradition under in the UK system, I guess it's more it's more of a norm now in the 21st century because well they they blame everything on our generation generation so it's norm now but back then it definitely wasn't but our generation has been born into a country that is spouting an ideal of independence and if you keep telling us that I was born in the independent nation of Antigua and Barbuda that I have my own prime minister, I have my own minister of foreign affairs, we make our own decisions on what we are going to do as a country, free democratic, freely, free and fair democratic elections for who will represent my view, then how in the same breath can you tell me that we still need to have, I'm not making any jabs, but for example, we still need to have a governor general who represents the queen. We still need to have the queen on our money when we are, are revamping the entire look of the currency in 2019. All these things still need to be there. And when I ask why, it's be, the answer is because it's always been like that. It doesn't make sense when you try and locate that in the idea of an independent nation. If an independent nation wants to, for example, change the currency and they don't want a certain figure on the currency anymore, then it should be within the ambit of the independent country to decide that. But yet for some reason, we're in a, we're, we're in a two, we're playing two roles at the same time. It's mm -hmm. independence when we feel like, and then it's, but we can't anger mother England or I not, it's no longer just England, it's also other world powers. We don't want to make them mad. And this is a system that pervades 
just beyond colonialism because the way that the world works now with the UN, etc., there are there are a lot of there is a lot of pressure from first world nations that third world nations have to bend to or feel I, I don't want to sound morbid, but or feel the repercussions. And the repercussions may not be war like it was once in the day, but it will still have an effect. Um, trade barriers or visa impositions or um, lack of, of, of products being sent down or services being sent to the country or donations in funds, something as simple as that. Um, all of that could be barred because of our decisions that we make as an independent nation, quote unquote. So it's really hard to be both. And I feel like without knowing it or my rationalization for why our generations always have this back and forth is that the older generation without maybe fully consciously accepting it has decided that tradition is what they were born into and tradition is what they will follow. Whereas the younger generation maybe again, not conscious, consciously being aware, have decided that if we are to be independent and make our own decisions, then those decisions should be ours and should be reasoned. One of the things that you seem to be pointing to is this idea of dependency, right? Like in the region, because we're small countries and we have small economic output compared to bigger countries on the global stage. And because we're still part of the Commonwealth, like, you know, there's bigger countries like Canada, we still have the queen on our money. We still have a governor general. It doesn't really make any sense. They don't really do anything. <laughs> um, but there's still this dependency on bigger nations who are outside of us to, like you're saying, provide us with certain services, provide us with certain goods. And part of that, issue as I see it is that we haven't really focused on becoming self-sufficient in a way that would support our independence. For instance, if you're getting a lot of your food from outside of the region, then you are beholden to those powers that you're getting your food from because if you make a decision that they're upset with and they go, well, we're cutting off your food, that, you know, that makes a joke out of your independence. So, it seems to me like the self-sufficiency needs to come first for you to actually be able to stand on your own two feet and say, you know what, I'm an independent country. I can make all these decisions for myself. In terms of young people growing up, absorbing this contradiction, I think it's really good that we're starting to think about this differently and even starting to apply some pressure to the existing system to just think about things in a different way. Now, I know that you're still in school and you'll be done soon, but what plans do you have for afterwards in terms of getting into the world of work and starting to bring some of these ideas into actual application? Um, thank you very much for that question. I, I, in tying into what you just said, where you think that self-sufficiency is important and should be the focus in order for for us to truly um exercise independence i i think i think i've always thought of that and i think it ties into the answer as to what i want to do but i want to qualify by saying i as a realist i don't know how possible it is for 108 square miles to be completely self-sufficient mm -hmm. and still, you know, benefit from the freedoms of, of democracy. And yeah, at least self-sufficient within the region too, right? So right. not necessarily each individual island, but collectively self-sufficient. I, I agree with that suggestion completely. And I do think that we take it for granted that each individual island may not be able to um, afford self-sufficiency but if we pull things together, I think there's more of a viable option. So what do I want to do? <laughs> I think I would definitely love to work within the OECS or work within CARICOM. Um, and 
I don't even think it needs to necessarily be in the legal arm. I don't want to limit myself in that way, but I would love to work in developments within the region. And I think it has to be development with a specific plan, a specific um, charts or, or goal in mind. And everyone, I say this often with my friends and people do laugh, but you know, I, I have some wild ideas. And I do think that, for example, a plain simple example, mm-hmm. as I said, 108 square miles may not be able to sustain itself in order for Antigua to grow all the food that Antiguans eat, let's just say, for example, it may take, it would take a lot of land space. Every individual island has the same problem with, they don't have enough land space to grow what they need to grow. Some islands in the south do have more space on the mountains or whatever, St. Vincent, Grenada, St. Lucia, I think they all still export agriculture uh, viably. And Antigua does as well, but not on the same scale that the, the Eastern Caribbean countries in the South do. And, but then the leads the problem of hurricanes, because when Hurricane Ivan hit Grenada, I think I recall a report saying that it took 10 years for the nutmeg um, production to oh. revitalize, because as when the tree is hit and the tree has to regrow, the first... I th- I may be mistaken, so I have to double check, but I think I was told that it takes 10 years from seed to um, bearing for a nutmeg tree. So things like that, we are not only vulnerable because of our size, we're also vulnerable because of our location. Mm -hmm. But then I always make the joke with people, and it's a joke, quote unquote, air quotes, but it's kind of serious. Why don't we just rely heavily on Guyana for growing agriculture and i say that because guyana is out of the hurricane belt and yes it may get storms it has its own um, natural disasters that we in the eastern caribbean don't deal with per se Um, river flooding i think there's more seismic activity in the south than there is in antigua for example but if guyana is the hub for agriculture quote unquote and then we just invest, the rest of us invest in shipping so that goods can be transported easier between the islands, then it removes not only space that is used in other islands for agriculture sustaining themselves, but it also removes some of the expense and some of the pressure because once, once, once an island is hit, that's that. And living on... Yes, again, independence is very important. And I'm not trying to, to suggest that we do away with the concept of, of um, national identities. But I do think in order for self-sufficiency, some of that has to give way. And we have to rely more openly and more um, wholeheartedly on each other without the idea that at first instance, one of us is going to betray the other. And that, that, that lack of, of trust that we have between each other is something that has been created. It was something that was told to us. We were always competing with each other. We still compete with each other. Look at tourism. Look at a great example is carnival. The carnival season has just ended. The summer carnival season has just ended. And every week, Starting with St. Vincent, everybody is loving pictures, but saying, I can't wait for my island to come around. Um, Then there was St. Lucia. People said it looked great, but they were too wild and you should come to our island. Then Barbados and Antigua happened on the same day. And people were literally comparing costumes from the two islands on the timeline, seeing which costumes got the most likes. And then Grenada which had a, a horrible um, situation with one of their mass camps, one of their mass bands, I believe Ex Nova is the name. And people were, I almost saw people overjoyed that, yeah, you guys chose to go to Spice Mass instead of ours. Look what happened to you. And that's horrible. That yeah. is really horrible. Support amongst each other is something that we definitely have to work on. And that's something that will deal and aid in self-sufficiency. Mm-hmm. 
Well, you touched on an important aspect of the youth culture now, which is the internet and how it's brought people just a lot closer together. Now you have a lot more people in your pocket than you ever did before. And you're a lot able to see what's going on in other places. Do you, do you think that that's had an overall positive or negative effect on the region and its cohesiveness? With everything, there are pros and cons. Mm -hmm. I definitely, I personally feel happy when I see on the timeline that um, certain a group of Antiguans, for example, went down to St. Vincent for Carnival this year. And when I saw them posting their pictures, I felt, I felt really good about that. There was set of St. Vincent's, Vincentians that went to Grenada and them posting their pictures as well. The, the inter-island um, connectivity, I really, really, really appreciate it. And if is the question, is that a positive thing or a negative thing overall? I don't know if it's based solely on the internet that we've become more connected because our families are already, there's, there's different parts of the family in different islands going up the chain. So maybe we were already connected, but now because of the internet, we're seeing it more and we can document it more, which in of itself, I think is a good thing having um, actual record of the interactions that, that our people are doing with one another. Uh, for example, Family, the song that won Road March in Trinidad was a collab between Masha Montano and Skinny Fabulous. And I don't know how many people know, but it was produced by a Dominican. And the reason that I found out is because my Dominicans on social media mm-hmm. kept informing me. <laughs> so. And, and that's good because I'm sure there are other songs back in the day that we just don't know their origin. And this could be wider applied beyond um, Soka, for example. I don't know, businesses in the Caribbean. We don't know who are the trendsetters or we, unless we look for it. But now we are better able to document these things. So I think documentation is a good thing. I do also think that it has the internet or the use of the internet has sparked more competition between our islands. And, uh, or I don't know if it sparked more or if because again of documentation, we see it more often. Overall, I think that it's a good thing. And as long as it's done in moderation, I do think that the documentation of our interconnectedness will be a good thing in the long run. What makes you excited for the future, Zachary? Oh, I am really looking forward to entering the world of work. And I know that may sound a bit strange, Mm -hmm. (laughs) especially to the younger viewers, um, but I've been, next year will be the eighth year of school consecutively from university. That's a lot of school. That is a lot of school. <laughs> and I, I, I do feel a bit disconnected. Most of my peers have already returned home and have started, you know, contributing to society. And I want to be able to contribute in my own way. I don't know if I'll be you know, any good or or anything. I don't know what my first job will be. I don't know what I will be asked to do. But whatever it is, I am looking forward to going there, wide-eyed and bushy-tailed, and giving it my all, and hopefully positively contributing to whatever it is that I'm asked to work with. Awesome. I'm excited to have you contributing to society as well. So let's talk about the appearance thing (laughs) for a second, because you have dreads, you have tattoos, you have facial piercings, and that's not something that is very typical in Caribbean or Antiguan culture yet. Are you concerned about any possible issues with your, you know, your entry into the world of work? given these, you know, decisions that you've made about your look? 
<laughs> uh, and I mean, and are you already encountering, you know, kind of discrimination or stigma or weird looks based on these things, especially in your field, which tends to be a bit more buttoned up? I, I'm definitely, I've definitely already encountered some um, pushback for lack of a better word. Mm -hmm. When I started growing my locks, which would have been uh, the, maybe the second year of university, so about six years now, most of the Antiguan professionals who I knew, every time they would see me, they would say, oh, this is just a phase. You're going to cut it before you come back to court, right? Mm -hmm. And at that time, if I'm not mistaken, there were only two lawyers in the Antiguan bar who had locks, and both of them were women. As of right now, I think that number has increased to at least nine, um, men included, but it's still nine out of however many, all the lawyers in Antigua is not a big number. Uh, and I personally, I always thought it was strange because I don't understand, especially in the field of law where most of our contribution comes from the way that we use our mind. I don't understand how a parents or how locks, how my hair falls or the tattoos that you can't see unless you come close enough to me to see them. Um, I, I don't see how that affects output. And mm -hmm. in my mind, that should be the only thing that matters. Once I am capable of doing the work and doing the work well, then that sh should be the only thing that, that, that affects um, any, any question of my capabilities. Mm -hmm. uh, it is unfortunate that we still have this discussion, especially I would say more so on locks. I do feel like having lived in Jamaica, having lived in Barbados, they have accepted natural hair a lot more than we have back in Antigua. I see um, MPs with locks, I've seen doctors, I've seen lawyers. Um, the, the, the upper class, quote unquote, also embraces natural hair, uh, which I think Antigua has only recently started to do. And I'm happy that we have started, but I, I am looking forward to hopefully being a, a representative of it, love the skin you're in, <laughs> love the hair that goes. <laughs> <example>. <laughs> yeah, it's a weird thing, especially with the locks, because it's something that is very native to the region. And yet we prefer, you know, the relaxed hair for women, you know, relaxed or have a weave or whatever to be quote unquote presentable. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, when my brother started growing his locks, my mom like almost had a mental breakdown. Like she was very unhappy about it, but. My grandmother had a fit. My grandmother, um, her voice raised a couple of octaves. <laughs> and, uh, my mother was also in the house and she was just like, why would you do that? Why would you let him do that? It's a horrible decision. Do you know how much stigma he's going to face because of it? And my response was, well, there's a lot of stigma that's attached to dark skin as well. And mm -hmm. I have no intention of changing my skin color. So I just have to deal with it. And <laughs> my mother, <laughs> my mother, out of sight from my grandmother, clapped her hands. But, <laughs> 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 but my grandmother has since come full circle and she's actually happier about my hair than my mother is, which is, which is kind of funny because at the beginning, <laughs> yeah. it was around, yeah. But um, I mean, I don't, I don't think that I'm, I'm not radical in the sense that we should do away with, you know, permed hair or a buzz cut. If a man wants to have his hair low, then right. that's up to him. If a woman wants to wear weave, then that's up to her as well. But I do think what's important is that what we ascribe, um, what we decide is professional I think it should be more reflective of how we look naturally as a people. Yeah, I agree with that. And also just give people their personal choice. What We don't all have to look the same. Yeah. We, we don't look the same. What is 
one of the best pieces of advice that you've received that you wish more people received? Oh, this is an easy one. One of the best pieces of advice that I have received is you should try and remember that what you think is normal is not everyone's normal. And it really resonates with me because, you know, a lot of, a lot of miscommunication, a lot of um, arguments or disagreements that happen, one person or both people take the opinion that how could you possibly do this? Mm-hmm. Because, you know, this, this is where my mind reached as an end result. So your mind should have reached there too. But that's not the case. That's rarely the case, to be quite honest. Everyone has their own um, personal uh, life, personal experiences that have colored the way that they look at things. So no two people are guaranteed to react the same way even if it's identical set of facts. And yeah, definitely has been one of the best pieces of advice that I've ever gotten. And I try my best to share it with as many people as possible whenever I get the chance. Mm -hmm. Very eye-opening piece of advice. And you remember how old you were when someone first kind of said that to you? Um, I was definitely in university. the, the, the specific age, maybe 21, 20. Um, it, was, it was around university. And I remember that because that was one of the first times that I've had to deal with so many differing opinions in one space. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, that was the advice that, that really helped me um, cope. Cope is not a nice word. It makes it sound like it was bad. But <laughs> <laughs> experience, it was just, you know, new. <laughs> mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Great. And just on the university thing, as someone who has been in tertiary education for, what did you say, eight years straight now, what are you doing to keep your mindset, you know, correct so that you can continue to do this really hard, difficult thing? I try very hard not to take other people's um, experiences as what should be my experience. So using a real world example, um, I would do a class, uh, I don't know, a final year class, just giving a name, let's say contract law, for example. And I would have spoken to people who have already done the class and their experience may be that it's horrible. It's the hardest thing that they've ever had to do. They would cry themselves to sleep at night. And when I try very hard not to internalize that because mm-hmm. taking, taking the view that their experience will be my experience without any um, questioning or just accepting it blank- blankly would, would make the situation worse for me. Mm-hmm. And I feel very comfortable. I feel the most comfortable going into new experiences saying, I don't know what I'm going to expect, but whatever it is, I will find a way for me to deal with it. You know what is best for you. And as simple as it sounds, sometimes you really just have to trust that. You have to trust that, that all right, Zachary, you, you got um, five exams coming up and you can set your, your schedule and you figure it out as best you can. It's not all the time that you figure it out. That's, that's something that I have to say and accept. It's not all the time that everything went well, but even in the times that it didn't go well, I learned about myself and I learned from the experience and I learned how to handle it better the next time. And I wouldn't have been able to do that had I just blindly followed someone else's experience. Very wise. For anyone who's listening to this and wants to learn more about you, wants to keep up with all your activities where can they find you online oh okay that's a okay yeah that's a plug yourself leap. <laughs> where can you find me online well i am active on social media but i my activities hold on this is going to be edited <laughs> <laughs> um okay Okay, well, you guys can find me on Facebook by searching Zachary Phillips. 
Z A C H A R Y P H I L L I P S. Facebook is really where I am the most active per se with posting social awareness things. I also have a LinkedIn, same name. And uh, I am a very down to earth guy. So I feel like if you also want to know the social Zachary, you can add me on Twitter at Z underscore black underscore O N E. Thank you so much, Zachary, for having this little conversation today. I really appreciate you taking the time and I wish you all the best in your future endeavors. Thank you very much. And I'm very happy to have been invited and I hope that, you know, it's beneficial to anybody who's hearing it. Thank you for listening to this episode of Grassroots Radio. If you enjoyed the conversation, show some love and help spread the word. You can do that by subscribing on Apple, Google, YouTube, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. Already subscribed? Consider leaving a five-star review. It helps other people find the show. If you have an idea for someone you want to see featured or a topic you want us to cover, let us know. DM us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at grassrootsanu or email us at thenewgrassroots at gmail.com. For more about NGR, visit us at thenewgrassroots.com. Until next time, this is Grassroots Radio.